and welcome back to 12 Steps to Poker Heaven. I'm Carmel Thomas and with me today is poker expert Mr Grub Smith. Are you right? I am very much enjoying my role as schoolmaster. Oh you, you are the schoolmaster. <laughs> now in the first part we taught you the fundamentals of how to play poker and uh, Grub also very clearly told us how to play Texas Hold'em. That's it we went through some basics we did the dealer button, the small blind, the big blind, we had the community cards in the middle, the flop, the turn and the river. We even played a hand and somebody won. We didn't though. No, we didn't. <laughs> now we're going to move on to step two, and that's whole cards. Now, Grub, I know there's a number of different cards you can be dealt with in the hole. Can you tell me those cute nicknames again? Well, some of them are cute. Some of them have been just been built up over the years for tradition. We start off with what's called American Airlines, mm -hmm. AA, also Alcoholics Anonymous, but uh, <laughs> most commonly they're called bullets because those look like bullet holes. And uh, very, very powerful hand, obviously. Next up... Two kings, that's known as cowboys. Mm -hmm. It's also called the kangaroos or King Kong, again, for pretty obvious reasons. After that, ace king. Now, this is called the big slick. It's also called Anna Kornikova because it looks pretty, but it doesn't win very much. Oh, yes. Then we've got ace queen. That's known as the big chick. And uh, Daniel Negrano, who's a very, very famous poker player, calls it 2.7 million. Why is that? Because that is how many dollars he's lost playing that hand. So it's, it's deceptive. It looks pretty, but it can lose you a lot of money as well. After that, we've got uh, sevens. Now, they're known as walking sticks, because they look a bit like walking yeah. sticks. Uh, also, hockey sticks, some people call them. Then we've got uh, deuces. Twos are called deuces, and uh, they're nicknamed the ducks, because if you look at them, they're a bit like a sort of duck or a yeah. swan floating on the water. If you get three of them, it's Huey, Dewey, and Louie, after Donald Duck's nephews. I'm sure you remember that from watching cartoons as a kid. Then we've got Queen Seven. That's known as the computer hand, because a computer program proved that that's about the average cards you can expect to start with. After that, we've got Nine Three. Now, that is known as the Montana Banana, because uh, somebody said that bananas are more likely to grow in Montana, which is a very, very cold place, than you to win any money playing 9-3. There we are. Grub, it's not just about getting good cards. You know, how important is your position? Well, position is vital in the game of poker. Uh, you've got to imagine it as being at war. You want to be on top of the hill, because mm -hmm. then you can see what everyone else is doing. If you're down in the trench, you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. So the later you act in a poker game, the, the more information you're going to get, the better position you have. And the best position of all is the dealer button. Because most of the time, he's going to be acting last. He's going to see what everybody else does before he has to make a decision. Let's look at a, a typical six-handed game I've set out here. The big blind and the small blind are both in already. So under the gun and first to act is this gentleman here who's picked up pocket threes. Now, in late position, that's not a bad hand. If you've seen everybody check round to you, you can think, well, pocket threes have got a chance. But in early position, with so many possible raises and re-raises in front of you, that's a very, very risky hand to limp in with. So you can either make a big bluff, or the most advised decision in that early position would be to throw them away. So we'll have him fold his cards. Then we come round. We're now getting into sort of middle position, these players here. Ace two. Now, it's an ace, but the kicker with it, that's the card that goes with the ace, mm -hmm. isn't very good. Obviously, ace-king is quite good, ace-queen, yeah. ace-jack, very playable hands. The only good thing about this is it's suited. There's a chance of making a flush. So let's say that he wants to see a cheap flop. He doesn't want to invest too much. He'll just call the big blind and hope nobody raises him. Similarly, the 9-10. Suited connectors, they're called. They're in the same suit and they're next to each other. Good possibilities of making a flush or a straight. Not a great hand, but probably worth, in this middle position, limping in to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Ideally, he'd just like to see everybody check it round so he can see the flop and then make a better decision with more cards and more information. Now the button. We say he's in the best position. In all subsequent rounds, he's going to be the last to act. He's picked up pocket eights. Now, pocket eights, he's seen nobody raise in front of him. He knows that when the flop comes down, there's probably going to be a higher card than his eight, mm -hmm. giving somebody a chance of having a better pair. But at the moment, he's probably in front. So he'd bump it up now. He knows he's got great position, pretty good cards. He really doesn't want really to see a flop. So he'll make a quite hefty raise, put it in the middle. The decision now comes round to the little blind. He quite liked his cards. King, queen suited. Again, good possibilities of a straight, good possibilities of a flush, and also quite high cards. If he's a loose player, by which I mean he takes a lot of risks, he might make a call here. A tight player would fold. So let's say he's playing tight, he, he liked his king-queen, but the, when he saw the raise, he thought, well, I'm probably in trouble, I'm going to get out of this. So he'd fold his cards as well. Round to the big blind, he's already in for, for, uh, for those two chips. He's got ace-king. Now, ace-king, 
It's a good hand to get aggressive with. You don't want to see too much company though, so he doesn't want to just call that and let these guys creep in as well. He'll probably come over the top, all in. Now we're playing no limit Texas Hold'em. That means at any time you can bet all the chips in front of you. So he's going to go all in and force these guys to make a decision. And to be fair, it's a pretty easy decision. They know that they're out of position, they're going to have to act before these guys. Therefore, the ace two, he's going to decide that's no good at all. He's going to fold, get out of the hand, cut his losses. Nine, ten, again, really not, no point getting involved. The dealer, though, he's got a pair of eights. He figures he's probably in a race. The only cards that are beating him are a pair of nines, a pair of tens, jacks, queens, kings, or aces. Against ace, king, it's actually about a 50 50 decision, what we call a coin toss. So he'd probably make the call, go all in, and then we'd go to the flop and we'd see who ends up the winner. Fantastic. So you can see position is really, really important then. OK, well, let's look at an example from the World Speed Poker Open. In speed poker, you only get 15 seconds to make your decision. It's high-octane stuff. You can call for a timeout. Raise to 12,000 total. Now, here we see Tony G. He's making a raise Pass. in early position. He's under the gun. Pass. Is that a standard raise Pass. for him? Yeah, about three times the big blind. He's advertising the fact that he's got strong cards and he's getting people to throw away hands like Jack Queen. Unfortunately for him, Tony Bloom in the big blind has picked up Pocket Kings, the second most powerful starting hand you can have. Now, would Tony Bloom be worried that Tony G had an ace? Yeah, he certainly would. The, the raise Tony G made in that position suggests he's got strong cards. Re-raise. And now, suddenly, Tony G is wondering what's going on. Ace Jack is quite a strong hand, and he, as I say, he advertised the fact he's got good cards. He made that, that bet almost out of position very early on, not knowing what everybody else had. So he would have to have had powerful cards to make that move. Time out. Time out. Now he's thinking, oh my god, Tony Bloom's got something even stronger. He's calling for a time out here. That's how serious it is. He wants to think about it. He's thinking, Tony's probably got a, a big pair or a big ace. Now, ace jack suddenly looks pretty small. I think if he was going to bet, he'd have done it already. Ten seconds. Thanks. Thanks, John. <laughs> well, there's no move in it. I pass. Pass. And there it is. He has passed, and Tony Bloom takes down the hand. <laughs> So, good. Tony G made the right decision. Could Tony Bloom have done anything different? Uh, yeah, Tony G made the right decision to throw those cards away. Tony Bloom might have thought he could extract a bit more money out of uh, Tony G uh, had he just flat called there and seen a flop. The trouble is, he had kings. He's pretty sure that Tony G's got an ace because he made that early position raise, which represents a powerful hand. So he doesn't want to see a flop with an ace in it. He decided that uh, discretion was the better part of valour. He could win what was on the table already and frighten the Australian mm. off, and that's what he did. And if he had aces, how should he have played them? Well, with aces, you know there's no chance anyone's got a better hand than you pre-flop. So he could have been a bit more cagey. He could have just flat called, seen a flop, checked it, hoped Tony G bet into it, and then come over the top. That way he'd probably have got more money out of it. But with kings, you know, discretion's a better part of valour. He won the pot, that's all he needed to do. Why don't we look at an example of this from the British Poker Open 2006? A very strong table here, some of the world's best players sitting around it. Gary Jones is in the small blind, John Gale in the big blind, so Noah Boakin will be first to act, he chucks his cards away. Now Gus Hanson, Gus is a famous player, always plays uh, almost any two cards, and there you go, he bumps it up to 6,000 with the Queen 10 suited. Koresh, a familiar face on the British poker scene, decides to call. Fraser is out of the way, but Gary Jones now is in the small blind with pocket aces. Raise it. So he's trying to do a little act here, but he bumps it up. Why did he bump it up and not slow play? Well, with aces, you don't want too much company. Aces are favourite against one hand or two hands, but if there are four people in there, you're actually going to win Five. less than half the time. He also knows Gus, being a loose player, may call. Koresh, having seen Gus call the 11,000, is now only having to bet 11,000 to win quite a big pot. So he's getting quite good value, even though he knows he's not in front. He's just hoping to hit a flop. Now, Gary will be first to act here. He's in the small blind. And that flop is quite dangerous for Gus, because he's picked up 
Eight. a ten. Now Gary's got a choice here. He can either slow play it or he can make a bet. I suggest he's going to make a bet. He doesn't want to let any of these guys catch it. There's probably one too many players in this hand for his comfort. So he'll probably bump it up, put in around 20,000. 28,000. Now, decision time for Gus. He saw that Gary, who's quite a tight player, raised pre-flop and he's raised on the flop. So he's got to think that his 10 probably isn't any good. Gus is one of the few players who would play here or even raise. Gary's trying to win it here and now. If he was trying to get more people to come along with him, he'd have checked it or made Pass. a very small bet. It'd be good if you could try to bluff Pass. Pass. As it is, he's probably thinking there's enough in the pot for my agents to win and I'd rather not be outdrawn. So, Greg, we've gone through two steps today. Can you quickly recap on those? Yes, we've started very much at the beginning. We've done the basics. We've learned about the dealer button, the small blind, the big blind, how the betting works, calling, checking, folding, raising. We've also seen the ranking of the hand, so you know what you should be looking for, all the way from a straight flush down to a, a high card. And then we've seen the importance of position in poker yes. in making your decision. Poker's a game of strategy, and you really do need to have good position and a good understanding of how that can affect the game. And if you watch this program over and over again, I promise you, you will be better than most poker players already. So think where the next steps in our ladder are going to take you. Well, thank you for today's lesson. Uh, join us next time when we're going to be taking you through the principal strategies to be playing pre-flop and post-flop poker. Bye for now. Bye-bye.